Welcome to the first Congressional District of Connecticut virtual candidate debate, sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Greater Hartford and West Hartford Community Interactive. I'm Libby Sweetek, a member of the Greater Hartford League of Women Voters, and I'm pleased to be joined today by our partners, West Hartford Community Interactive and their executive director, Jennifer Evans, and her competent staff. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization which is encourages informed and active participation by citizens and government. We are especially pleased to be involved this year in providing the debate during the League's 100th anniversary as, as an organization, as well as the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment granting women the right to vote. I will be joined here today by other League members who will help time and answer questions. Cassie Backman, Doretta Antonucci, Joan Twiggs, Deb Poulin, and our moderator, Carol Moridi. I'm gonna turn this over to Carol Moridi to introduce our candidates and get to start the debate. Carol. Thank you, Libby. And uh, welcome to our candidates, Tom McCormick, Mary Fay, and John Larson, who are on the screen. Uh, in a few moments, they will have two minutes for an opening statement. But first, a review of the format for this event and how you, the audience, can participate. The debate will be conducted in a modified cumulative time format, which allows our candidates to freely elaborate on their approaches to a variety of issues unimpeded by the strict time constraints of more traditional debate formats. Each candidate will have a total of approximately 20 minutes for responses to the questions assuming that we receive some questions from our webinar observers. Um, and we also have some prepared legal and voters questions that are appropriate to this office. The audience is encouraged to submit written questions via the Q&A tab on the bottom of your Zoom screen. The questions team will screen them to avoid duplication and check for appropriate content for this congressional seat. The questions may be submitted at any time during the event. Each question posed will be asked of all the candidates. When speaking, each candidate is timed. Periodically, the timekeepers will message the candidates and the moderator regarding the amount of time remaining for each candidate. Um, each one, as I said, has an individual timer. Uh, Deb Poland will take care of Tom McCormick, Cassie Bachman is Mr. Larson, and Doretta Antonucci is taking care of Mary, Mary Faye's time. Candidates are encouraged to rebut and sur-rebut, re responding to their policy and philosophical differences as they perceive them, understanding that the clock is running. Each round of questions is, is initiated by the moderator and each candidate has an opportunity to address the question before the rebuttal between and among the candidates is invited. Zoom is a relatively new venture for us. It has been successful in two previous meetings, but we know that COVID-19 has brought many, many changes. And I'm sure you have experienced some bumps during the eight month challenge in communicating with your friends, colleagues and work associates. We hope everything goes smoothly, but as we have all learned, we don't know how it, it's going to go. If we didn't know before, we know it now that we have to be a little patient. Um, we had a little uh, video at the beginning of this program to allow all of our observers and questioners to come in. And I hope that you found that educational. The, uh, that was done for the town of West Hartford but every step along the way is true for every district throughout Connecticut with, um, within the realm of the Secretary of the State of Connecticut. So now it is my pleasure to introduce the candidates who have committed their time and energies to this important aspect of the democratic process running for elective office. I did a, and we did have a lottery for who would speak first for the two minute introduction. And the order is Mr. Tom McCormick, followed by Ms. Mary Fay, and uh, concluding with Mr. John Larson's opening statement. So right now I turn it over to you, Mr. McCormick. 
Right. Good day. Thank you. And thank you to the League of Women Voters. Um, you're a necessary part of our democracy. We need civil organizations such as yours to keep our democracy vibrant. And also to the public television station, um, another vital part of getting information to the voters to be able to decide our critical issues. And I would like to see public television expanded um, especially into the courts. There's no reason why the Supreme Court should not be televised so we know what's going on in the highest court in the land. So we need more public television. Um, the platform of the Green Party is at gp.org, just backslash platform. And there's four major ideas or pillars of the party, democracy, social justice, ecology, and peace. Democracy is most important. Um, we had a revolution in this country 1776, um, the first government for a rule by the people, for the people, uh, and a constitution that went with it, a very good constitution, one that's a slightly out of date, but a very good one. And one manner in which our constitution does need to be changed in order to bring us greater democracy is changing the way the Senate is elected and the Senate's power. We have a very big democracy deficit. Right now, California, I think it's something close to 40 million voters. A state like Montana, Vermont are under a million. So when an individual goes to vote in California, they get 1 40th or even a little bit less than that equal representation in the US Senate. That's a democracy deficit and that has to change. Um, also direct, we need the direct election of president um, for our democracy. Social justice, um, there's a lot of agitation in the streets and rightly so. Um, African Americans are being killed by the police disproportionately, there's no question about that. And so we need massive retraining of the police on how to take a suspect into custody without killing them. It's a very simple thing. Thank you, Mr. McCormick, your two minutes is up. Thank you. And uh, we go now to uh, Mary Faye. Welcome, Mary. Uh, you'll have to unmute yourself, Mary. Must have been. There been you go. Room. Yes, I'm in control. yes, good evening. And Carol, nice to see you again. And thank you to the League of Women Voters for having this debate. I think it's great for people to get the opportunity to see where candidates stand and uh, hear their thoughts and what they're thinking. So I'll, I'll just offer a very brief introduction because I think a lot of people know me around Greater Hartford, but uh, I'm a West Hartford Town Councilor and I grew up in East Hartford and I was very fortunate. I had great parents, a wonderful family, terrific sisters, two sisters and a brother. And we had a great experience. Hartford Public Schools uh, educated all of us and we had very, very good teachers and good programs. My mom herself was a teacher in the system. And uh, my dad, his first job out of Yukon was working for Pratt Whitney. So East Harper will always be very close to my heart. And um, we've all gone on to do different things. And I went on to Skidmore College and uh, started working in finance and insurance and earned an MBA while I was working and got that part time. So I just want people to understand that I bring a different skill set, but I've had the benefit of being a two term counselor or so. Um, I've worked in government for a short time, and I also had a state job for a short time, so uh, kind of know how it's different from business. But um, I want people, everybody in this district, to have the same experience that I just described, to really have a great school experience, to be educated well, and to have great scores, and have the experience to play sports, and all the other things that we got to do in music and art and everything else. So my platform is... is uh, really three key items that I think are really critically important to this district. So the first is the economy and we've got to grow that. In fact, our economy in Connecticut has not changed since 2008 recession. In fact, we're a laggard and we've been that way for a long, long time uh, and nothing changes. So my theme is really it's time for a change. And the second thing that I'd like to focus on is public safety. That's critical. And it's very personal to me because I come from a New York Police Department family on the face side. So I know what they sacrifice to go out there and keep us safe. So I back the blue and I believe we have to keep our policemen 
engaged and get the best talent that we can to protect us. Now, that doesn't mean that we ignore the bad guys. Of course not. Prosecute them to the fullest ability. If they commit a crime, they get the same justice that anybody else does. So I think that that's very, very important, too. And then education. I described that a little bit, my experience. And Mary, I'm sorry to interrupt. Your two minutes opening up. is up. And right. you can, if you click on the chat feature, you can see your time periodically. Yeah, I can see that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Larson, we move to you. Well, thank you, Carol, and good evening, everyone, and thank you to the League of Women Voters and the West Hartford Community Interactive for hosting this debate tonight. I commend the other candidates for participating in our democracy. Elections are about the future, and the future is now. Americans are living through unprecedented times, bravely confronting this ever-present pandemic. The inadequate response by the Trump administration, their failure to follow the facts, rely on sound science and medical advice, and most importantly, to unite the American people in an all-out war against this virus has left America exposed and weakened to the virus and has compounded our economic problems as well. The health of our people and the health of the economy are inextricably linked and America can do better than this. In March, we came together as Democrats and Republicans to pass the CARES Act to provide immediate relief to America. It's the way things should be done in this country. We knew that wasn't gonna be enough, however. And the chair of the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell said it best. We need to go big and we need to provide more relief and we need to do it now. The House did, I was proud to represent this district there. The House passed the HEROES Act to provide more money we did that more than six months ago. Americans need help and they need it now. It's been six months since then and the Senate Republicans have failed to act. Why? Because they are frozen in the ice of their own indifference. Indifference to the millions of unemployed Americans who are without jobs. Indifference to the families that need help putting food on the table the indifference to the thousands of small businesses struggling to get by like Jody Marnot at Stackpole's in Hartford, who I talked to this Saturday, the difference to the restaurants that have gone out of business, the indifference to the more than 215,000 Americans who have died from this virus. They have not put forward a plan. We will continue to put forward our plan. We have compromised and put forward a plan. The president can't even get the Senate to go along with a plan. We need to act and we need to act hey, now. John, I'm so sorry to future, interrupt, but your time is up. Now. Thank you, Mr. Larson. And um, I would like to um, uh, address this to Jennifer uh, Evans, our uh, WHCI person. We have been Zoom bombed, if you have not seen it already. And I hope the 83 participants minus the person that is doing this will understand if we are not um, able to take any further questions from you. But I will do my best to make a good variety of questions um, available to our candidates to answer responsibly and critically in the spirit of a democratic society. So to begin, I am going to um, use the same order that we used for the speakers, but I will rotate the questions. So the first question will go to you, um, Mr. McCormick, then followed by Mary Faye, then Mr. Larson, and then it will go to Mary Faye, and then Mr. McCormick, and then Mr. Yeah, I, I, I've got it all have her so I think fiscal issues is an issue uh, that's very important to everyone and on the minds of everyone. The Associated Press reported last week that the federal budget deficit hit an all-time high of 3.1 trillion in the 2020 budget year, more than double the previous record as the coronavirus pandemic shrank revenues and sent our spending soaring. The Fed chair has said a number of times that in the midst of this worldwide pandemic, it is not the time to stop spending. So the question is, what is your position on handling the deficit as a matter of policy in your role as a congressperson? And that goes to you, Mr. McCormick, first. 
Um, I think um, Kenzie in economics is exactly right that in time of recession, that the federal government does need to pump money into the economy to raise aggregate demand. Um, so I have, I have no problem with government's spending. It's where they're getting the money to spend. That's the issue. Um, I'm in favor of running a federal surplus, essentially a rainy day fund. And that fund should be stocked just to start, for instance, by having uh, market price royalties on gas and oil and all the minerals. Natural resources belong to the American public as a whole, but essentially we're giving them away with very low royalty rates. So we should be collecting more money in, in those areas. Also, one way to get a Fed run to a federal surplus, which has tremendous benefits because when government goes to do an action, if they're paying interest on the debt, they can get less of what they want to accomplish. Otherwise, you don't want to give money away to the banks and the financial industry in order to build roads or provide for the national defense or react to the COVID. So you want a government surplus. So when times are tough, the money is there. The state of Connecticut, for instance, has the rainy day fund. That's a very good idea also for the federal government. Um, and one way to get more money, I think we do need to raise taxes, but not on the middle class, which has happened under Reagan and under the Republicans. We've had middle tax cuts that have been very, very small compared to what's been on the top. So we need to go back to a progressive tax system like we used to have under the Eisenhower administration back in the 50s, which, by the way, was a time of economic growth in this country in general, but particularly a time of economic growth for the middle class. So we need much higher taxes on wealth as far as inheritance taxes go. So we don't build up an aristocracy in this country. Money, you know, being inherited in terms by tens and tens of billions of dollars isn't necessarily going to economically efficient people. So that money needs to be recycled back into the economy to address COVID, to address our education deficit, for instance. We're not doing very well on math and science. So let's start with the money that we already have so we have more of it. Don't pay interest to serve the functions of government. Thank you, Mr. McCormick. Ms. Fay, it's your turn. Yes, thank yes. you. Very much. Uh, first of all, I, I think, you know, obviously economics and the economy are extremely important, but the, one of the main reasons that I am running is because Washington politics and business as usual, people are fed up. While Congressman Larson likes to play the blame game and blame President Trump for his handling of Corona and other things. I mean, everything. The guy's only been in office for 40 something months and it seems like everything that's happened in the world is his fault. I'm not here to defend President Trump. I'm not here to advocate for any other politician except for myself. And I believe that I will have the ability to cut through this. We have to compromise. We have to come together. This working uh, like it is with finger pointing and blame games and you know, the, the Heralds Act that you mentioned, Mr. Larson, um, Very much it had so. work in it. It had things that have nothing to do with Corona. Corona is serious. Uh, I know people who have gotten it and I know people who have died from it. So we all take it seriously. We're all responsibly socially distancing and wearing our masks, but that's not the only reason that a state like Connecticut, and I know this is a federal position, believe me, but uh, Connecticut's a laggard and it's behind. It's been way behind before Corona and Aetna and GE, my former employer, are gone. And we can't do this anymore. We have to get this place on track. So I'm about rebuilding the communities in our district. As you know, it's 700 miles, 27 towns, uh, community by community. And I want to listen to what people are, are worried about and concerned about. And I'll tell you, it's the economy. They're worried about that. First and foremost, their jobs, their security. They're worried about public safety. They want to make sure that they can go out in their neighborhoods and be safe. Their children can be safe. The children can go to school safely. And they're very worried about the future of our education. Honestly, this I have a 10-year-old. I know you've got three children, John. Um, you know, this 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 online virtual education 
has no substitute for a, a in-room school teacher. I respect teachers. I love teachers. As you know, my mother was a teacher in East Hartford. Uh, you were my teacher in East Hartford. And you were fabulous. Really, really great. Terrific. An outstanding coach and an outstanding person in the school. And you, we were really, really lucky to have you. Uh, but we got to focus on those three things. That's what some people's minds, that's who's hurting the small businesses where 60% of our people are employed throughout the country. Um, it pains me. <laughs> you know, you go through storefronts, you go through delis. Who would have thought these places would be out of business? Places that have been in business for decades. And we've got to figure out things. We need innovation. We need change. We need new people. We can't keep sending the same people back to government and expect a different response. We have to work together. We have to think out of the box. We have to be innovative. And I'm very pragmatic. I've been a business person very successfully for the better part of my career. And I want to bring those skills and the ability to cut through clutter and get things done to Washington, D.C. And that's why I'm running. Thank you, Mary. And now, Mr. Larson, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Yes, it is your turn to address Let's this question. Speak for them, uh, speak for themselves. Uh, let's, for a moment, just focus on the HEROES Act, which we passed six months ago. That would have meant $7 billion coming into the state of Connecticut to our municipalities and to the state. I spoke with Governor Lamont how desperate the state needs this kind of money. And yet, you talk about the deficit and debt, 83% of the Republican passed tax cut went to 1% of the people, creating that $2 trillion deficit. I'm sure everybody out there in the audience, especially all you hardworking people in the first congressional district, breathe a sigh of relief knowing that you've helped out President Trump, who's going to pay less in taxes than most of you do billions of dollars that he has, that he has paid no taxes on whatsoever. This isn't about the blame game. This is about getting the facts out there and creating a more equitable system. The Fed chief has it exactly right. We inherited from the Bush administration in 2008 and 2009 a recession. And then Democrats came into the majority and we dug our way out of that and did it in a fiscally sound manner. We cannot, as the Fed chairman said again, not spend the money needed and required to not only for our states and municipalities, but how about for our first responders? And how about for our frontliners to make sure that our hospitals and our nurses and our care providers and police and fire are getting the monies that they needed? That's what's in the HEROES Act. That's what they are to make sure that we provide stimulus and payments for families and extend enhanced unemployment and for small businesses especially so that retailers and restaurants can get the kind of benefits that they need now. That's what's so frustrating the American people is that one branch of government, one house of the Congress has been working. One house has passed legislation and the other continues to do Nothing. The Republican controlled Senate needs to do their job and get in and vote. They can't even agree with the President of the United States, who at least has been sitting at the table with Mnuchin negotiating on a regular basis. The House stands ready to come in and pass. And as I said in my opening statement, we will come in and pass to make legislation to make sure the people of this district are provided for. Thank you, Mr. Larson. And if anyone has a rebuttal, this is the time to raise your hand or let me know. We have spent a good amount of time on this particular question, uh, 15 to 20 minutes. So I'd say that it has been um, addressed quite thoroughly by um, each of you. Yes, uh, let's move away from Mer uh, Ms. Fay. Yes, Do you have a rebuttal? Yes. I just briefly, um, you cannot tax your way to prosperity. That's, that just doesn't work. We need jobs. We need to keep um, you know, taxes low for corporations. We, we've already seen companies coming back. We've had the best employment numbers for all races, black, Hispanic, white, than we've ever had. Unemployment came to an all time low. We were doing fantastic until Corona came around. 
better than fantastic. GDP was up more than it ever was under Obama, way more. And we were bringing back manufacturing, we were re repatriating companies. The tariffs were helping us get our fair share of balancing our trade deficits. And I, I think that's the secret. You don't just tax your way out of a big ditch. So uh, taxes are not the way to go. I would oppose that. Thank you. All right, um, Mr. Larson. Do we get a chance to rebut? Yes, you do, Mr. Jo Mr. Larson. We're not talking about taxes here. We're talking about putting people back to work. We're talking about an infrastructure program that will make sure that not only the roads and bridges that need to be built, but the very school buildings you addressed earlier, Mary, are taken care of along with the various uh, water works that need to be done, but also in terms of intermodal transportation, whether it be rail, whether it be our airports, whether it be our highways, we need to make sure that we're investing that money the way the federal government used to do it. And in this way, put people back to work and lift that economy. The old saying is John Fitzgerald Kennedy would say, a rising tide will lift all ships unless they're permanently tied to the bottom. And that's what's happened in the Trump administration, locking people at the very bottom, while those at the very top get 83% of the tax cut. There is no way that any American thinks that's fair. Thank you. Let's go on to another question. Um, in the preamble of the United States, it says, we the people in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. And it goes on. There are many groups in this country that feel left out from this promise. Racial groups of, um, that, that we see in the streets now in many parts of our country, indigenous peoples, LGBTQ and more communities, and those with disabilities are often left out of the discussion altogether. What are you, um, what are your policy priorities or actions to ensure equity and access for all of these groups to the social and political rights that um, we should all have in this country. You can address voting rights, education, family and marriage, any number of topics that um, are of interest to you. Ms. Faye, we'll start with you. Oh, yes, you Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Carol. Uh, of course. Uh, Is that me? Who's echoing? Somebody's echoing in the background. Okay. Uh, any sort of discrimination, whether it's racial, sexuality, creed, religious, is wrong. And that's not what America is. We have never fostered that or believe in that. That's not our value system. And uh, it happens. You know, I, if I get elected, actually is just running, I am actually the first LGBTQ candidate from Connecticut to run for uh, federal office. So I know what it's like. I've been in those shoes. I know what it's like not to be, you know, treated fairly in, in job choices or promotions or a whole host of things. Um, but you gotta push through it and educate people and people on your own one-on-one -on -one basis that get to know you and you know that goes away. So a lot of it's fair based, but I think we have to constantly be vigilant about it. But I believe in meritocracy. I believe the best person should get the job. I believe the best person should get whatever they're competing for. And I, my plan would have a plan to help people pull themselves up to have the type of education and the opportunities in front of them that every American deserves. Um, it's possible, it's possible. And clearly what we're doing isn't working because the general sentiment among people and the race division, which, gosh, I would have thought would be much better than it is, considering how long ago slavery was. But we got to be vigilant. We got to keep working on that. And everybody deserves the same opportunity. And the best athlete or the best candidate or the best what have you deserves to win. And we have to bring up others and we have to let everybody get to a level playing field. That's my belief. And that's, I think, what I think you how you solve these things. 
Thank you. Um, Mr. Larson. Thank you, Carol. Uh, let me say that I agree with a number of things that uh, Mary had to say, but it's been my highest honor in Congress to serve with John Lewis, who passed away uh, this year. But John Lewis was a crusader for civil rights for all. In fact, indicated and was a strong supporter of our Social Security 2100 Act because he knew that that was where the next civil rights movement would lead. We started this program off this evening. You heard from Sherry Cantor as she was talking about the need and what the extensive efforts that the League of Women Voters and clerks around the uh, country are doing to make sure that people have greater access to the polls. We should be doing everything possible. And most important and fundamental to that is education. Imagine, if you will, that 70% of Americans don't know that there are three branches of government. And when you, fit, when you think about that staggering statistic and the lack of teaching of civics in history in our, in our school systems today, it just confounds one's mind to know and understand how people can not be educated in the very democratic process that makes us the great country that we are. So whether it's access to polls, whether it's furthering our education, whether it's following through on the commitment to civil rights and every single aspect of civil rights, as you said at the outset, Carol, uh, it's toward a more perfect union. We're not there yet. We have an awful lot of work to do, but I'm honored to have served with people like John Lewis who go about that work every day. It's not just an elected official's responsibility. It's everyone's responsibility. Thank you, Mr. Larson. Mr. McCormick. Um, I agree with John about civics, especially. Um, when it comes to history, I ripped off Santiana, um, famous dictum, and I say this, there are those that want you to be ignorant of history so they can go on repeating it. Um, the elites, through all the time that we know of a world history, have never wanted the average person to have a decent education, never. It's not in the interest of the elites and of the wealthy for people to know what's going on. It's a simple fact. Um, I support much higher federal spending in education, much, much higher. There's been in general a decrease in support and we've seen this, and now we don't get as many Nobel Prize winners in the sciences these days as we used to in technology and innovation. This country is on the downhill in that manner or in that regard. Um, I absolutely support extending public education for two more years, at least through community college or two years of training in the trades, skill training of all sorts. Um, you mentioned in your opening um, general welfare. I take a very broad view of what general welfare means. And I believe in an activist government that people can come together democratically and decide what they want their government to do and to accomplish it. Um, the issues of discrimination came up. Mary talked about it and I agree with her. Um, I'm one of my cards, I have simple saying, equal treatment for all and all things. Unfortunately, in this country, and we've seen religion, religious belief being used to justify bigotry. Um, no religious test in the Constitution, and I really no religious test in public policy also. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any uh, further? Okay, I'm going to go to one of the questions from our, our uh, participants. Um, the question is, I had health insurance until December 31st, 2019. I cannot afford health insurance for the first time in my life since I make more money than would qualify for a subsidy. Under Obamacare, my premiums have tripled and the out-of-pocket maximum has grown to an unreasonable level with the bronze plan. What will you do to make health insurance affordable for every American, even those who do not qualify for a premium subsidy? And this goes first to you, Mr. Larson. 
Well, uh, best things that we did in my time in Congress was pass the Affordable Care Act. And we heard from our Republican colleagues for the next eight years that they were going to repair and replace it. In fact, they did nothing but weaken this process throughout. We need to strengthen the Affordable Care Act and all, all its levels. There are a number of people in this country who have insurance currently and who are happy with the insurance that they have. We're in a transitional phase. Joe Courtney, myself, and Brian Higgins have offered legislation that would allow people to buy into Medicare starting at age 50. That would do a couple of things. That would number one, make the Medicare group younger and allow people to get insurance at what the Kaiser Family Foundation has said is 40% less than insurance under the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. This would be a deep discount, as well as them making those who are at insurable risk from age 27 to uh, age 49. That would also actuarially drop down the cost of insurance and make it that much more affordable and accessible. The main thing is that we have to make sure that pre-existing conditions and nobody in the same kind of situation that the questionnaire has put in finds themselves with the inability to get insurance and make sure that they're able to afford it for them and their families. Thank you. Um, Mr. McCormick, this next goes to you. Um, I'm for a universal healthcare system where all healthcare practitioners are in civil service positions. Um, I kind of have a little trite saying, um, the insurance, health insurance corporations are parasites, leeches that are sucking the life force out of the American public from a oozing wound on their side. And that wound is about to rupture and bleed them out. Let's look at the simple facts of the health insurance corporations and the system that we have with them at least 25% of all healthcare dollars, government Medicare money, the premiums you pay, do not go to healthcare providers. We have a horrifically inefficient system of private insurance corporations. Um, so I'm for putting practitioners on the government payroll, meritocracy, so to speak, on civil service positions, not saying you can't have insurance, health insurance if you want it, but I think we should have a system where you wouldn't want to have it. We need to really move to a system of where we're more, more concerned in our health and health field with nutrition, because we are what we eat. We get sick because of what we eat. We have um, the general food supply in this country um, is junk food for calorie wise, it's over 50%. That's why we get sick. We have diabetes and these things, heart issues. Um, so nutrition is number one for health because it's not an insurance issue. It's really a health issue. So we need to move to a system of well care rather than sick care and prevention. You, when you, everyone can get to see a doctor, go to a community clinic, go to a university clinic or any type of public health clinic and be seen when symptoms first arise, you'll save a tremendous amount of money. Other places in the world, and I would say Go to PBS Sick Around the World, Frontline Show. They take care of their citizens' health at a third of the cost, at half the cost, with the same general level of public health and life expectancy. Our present system with the health insurance corporations is essentially just ripping off the American public, grabbing the dollars that need to go to health care, not to their private profits. Thank you. Ms. Fay. Yeah. Um, so health insurance. So insurance in general is something that I've got a lot of experience with. Uh, I've run several health insurance businesses as well as retirement um, businesses. So health insurance, I mean, the margin that the health insurers, the companies, the Cygnus of the world, the Aetna's of the world, it's, they're not making tons and tons of money. In fact, on many cases, they lose money because of the risk involved and uh people's behavior. You can't really control that. So I would like to just mention a couple of things about the Affordable Care Act that I think are very, very critical and for people. It was not the answer uh, and all be all by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, when Obamacare came out, 
um, costs did not go down. They went up. And we, many doctors and providers chose not to participate because of the reimbursement system. So that's a fallacy. And what happened when the Obamacare came out, it gave employers, remember the saying, if you want your health care, if you like your health care, you can keep it. That's baloney. I had a great plan and it wasn't a catalog. It wasn't like, you know, the government <laughs> Congress gets, but it was a decent program with co-pays and co-insurance and things like that. Everybody moved to a high deductible plan. You have to spend $10,000 of your own money if you have a family before you get any reimbursement. So what does that do? To Mr. McCormick's point, people don't do well care because why spend all this money if it's not going to get any relief from the cost of it? And losing your provider and uh, not having the simple plans, it hurt. And it hurt people and it hurt businesses. And many businesses stopped providing it altogether and said, go get it on the market. So I think the government, you know, I used to run stop loss business too. So that there's a bunch of different ways that we can provide insurance without having a big, huge you know, bureaucracy of administrative costs, which is what my fear is. If the government administers it, they've never been good at that. They're not, I mean, they're operating on COBOL systems and they don't have the technology and they don't, they don't have the expertise. They don't have the people that really know what they're doing to run these things, I believe. The answer is in the private sector. And uh, I don't think every answer is there, but I think for healthcare, it certainly is. There's a lot of very good companies out there that are constantly innovating. Um, you know, CVS Caremark now is in a different business than just retail pharmacies. You can use that as a quick doc stop and get your blood pressure taken, get shots, get immunizations. We're trying to make it convenient for people. So I think. That's where the answer lies. But Obamacare, no. And in, per in terms of Mr. Larson's point that the, the Republicans didn't do anything, it's because they couldn't get the vote over the goal line to repeal it. You can't fix it until you repeal it. And I think we could have done things. And I believe that pre-existing conditions absolutely positively have to be covered. I believe youth have to be covered up until they're well out of college, 25, 26, because the economy is so bad for millennials. And I really believe the, the private sector will come up with an answer and that everybody deserves to have good health care. It's a right, not a privilege. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone care to comment some more? Mr. Larson? Since uh, Mary uh, raised my uh, name, let me start by saying that in 2008 and 2009, during that recession, you know, when people saw their 401ks become 101ks, that government run program called Social Security never missed a payment. That government plan called Medicare makes sure that nobody above the age of 65 can retire and find themselves at the mercy of health insurance companies that actuarially would no longer carry them on the books. So when Mary says that uh, government can't run programs well, just take a look at social security and everybody out there in this audience knows this. Why? Because for years, Republicans have been trying to say that this is an entitlement plan, but people aren't fooled because all they have to do is look at their pay stub. It says FICA federal insurance contribution. It has a 99% loss ratio. Mary's in the insurance business, so was I. We understand what that means. It means that it's one of the most efficient and proficient ways to make sure that people get money. And of course, as I said, while 401ks became 101ks, social security never missed a payment, not a pension payment, not a disability payment, not a payment to a spouse or dependent child. That's why I so strongly support it and have put in legislation not only to support, but enhance it so that it's there for all Americans, especially during this most critical time of a pandemic when the elderly themselves are the ones who are the most vulnerable and need our assistance the most. Uh, uh, quick rejoiner here, please. Um, Mr. McCormick, go ahead. Yeah, Mary Fay, um, please realize something. When I was on Connecticut way back through um, Chamber of Commerce, I checked. And Connecticut was keeping 
15% of all healthcare dollars, all premiums that were I paid to Connecticut stayed in-house and never went out the door to a health care provider, 18%. Tell me, tell me, Ms. Fay, what is the administrative cost of Social Security? I know the Senator certainly knows, but please tell us, what is the administrative cost of the Medicare program? How efficient is the government in redistributing those dollars and seeing the health care providers get their money? It's higher than 18%, I can tell you. No, it's under 5%. It is under 5%. I don't, I don't believe that. <laughs> so it's the truth. <laughs> 18% is not a profit to the insurance company. It's paying for the customer <laughs> service, the claim payers, all the things that need to be done, credentialing providers, all, you know, the things that to run a health insurance business. Um, you asked, so you're mixing metaphors here. You asked about social security. Uh, I don't know what that has to do with the administration of healthcare. Well, what does uh, it cost? What is the administration of healthcare cost through the social security administration? Congressman Larson, why don't you tell the lady? Okay. <laughs> don't have to be, you know. Well, just tell the truth. I don't know. I, I don't okay. think it's 5%. I don't have the number okay. right now. Okay, we're not going to prove it here. Mr. Larson, do you have anything further to contribute? Uh, <clears throat> no, I think they've contributed well. Okay, thank you very much. I'll move to a slightly different topic, uh, more than a slightly different topic, but still um, concerned with impacts of COVID on our country. The world has changed greatly. How do you propose that Congress navigate and influence our relationships with other countries. And this goes to you first, Mr. McCormick. Um, if you check out my website, um, tomforcongress.org, it's tomforcongress.org, you'll see I have quite a bit there regarding um, foreign relations. I am for a strong United Nations, and particularly the United Nations needs to be given a military force which the original charter envisioned. There is a military office within the UN structure, but it's not, doesn't have the troops and it needs the troops. It needs the troops to stop one country from crossing an international border and attacking another country. When China moved into Tibet, there was no force to stop them, was there? When Israel has moved into the West Bank, there's no force to stop them and kick them out. So we need a strong UN military reaction force, not only against nation states, but also against terrorist groups. When you get a group like in South Sudan, um, start fighting terrorists, you need a force that can go in there and sit on them and squash them and put them out of business, period. The Sunni holy warriors are wreaked havoc in Iraq and Syria, and it took a long time to get them out of business. And thank God for the Iranian militias. Trump's trying to take credit, but it was the Iranian militias that drove ISIS out of Mosul, for instance. Um, so we need a strong international force. We shouldn't leave it up to different countries with their own national interests. Um, the United States is the rogue state in international relations. And I'll give you an example. The United Nations voted, I think, 174 to zero to outlaw nuclear weapons test. Guess who was on the zero, voted absent? The United States, along with Israel. On the cluster bomb treaty, there's a thing on my site about that. The United States is objecting. Landmine treaty, the United States is objecting. Biological warfare treaty, the United States is objecting. There's been an overwhelming vote in the United Nations to prohibit the weaponization of space. Who is objecting? The United States. We are no longer a country of law. We are a, increasingly becoming a rogue international actor and that needs to end. Thank you, Mr. McCormick. Um, Ms. Fay, you are next. Thank you, Carol. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think the question was about COVID. So uh, am I wrong about that? Can you repeat How, the question? Uh, it has changed the world. How do you navigate in, and influence our relationships with other countries? Okay, um, thank you. I want to get back to the original question. I wasn't sure um, where we're going there. So um, 
you know, I think I think diplomacy is the best approach, but we have to be strong and show that we uh, don't tolerate behaviors from you know the international players who are either threatening us or threatening one of our allies or you know doing things they shouldn't be in, in, in violation of some of the agreements that we have. So diplomacy diplomacy is always better. I'm pleased that we've gotten most of our troops out of harm's way. Uh, we can't fight these useless wars that really never end and don't accomplish anything that's in the United States and America's best interest. So I believe in peace and that's what I would like to see. Uh, but we can't trust everybody else to always be our friend. So we need to have our guard up. I'm glad that the president has rebuilt our military. I think that's critically important. And it's also very critical for our district here in Connecticut with uh, United Technologies, Raytheon, um, so much of suppliers to them, electric boat. I, we need to be a player in, in the defense industry. So I think we need to always make sure that we have what's needed in case somebody does you know, infringe on our soil or do something that's very detrimental to Americans. In terms of COVID, it, that, that's something that we're learning about. You, more and more and more and more. First masks were, weren't good, that they were good, then we're not sure. Um, it's easily contractable, then it's not so much. It's large gatherings. Well, now maybe we shouldn't have Thanksgiving. I, I think we need more information and data around that, but I think we have to start at some point reopening up safely our schools, our economy, and people's social lives. If you realize this has gone back to March, it's an awfully long time. And I think people are starting to feel like shut-ins. It is hard. I mean, I think we've adjusted to doing things in a remote way, just like we're doing tonight. Uh, certainly my work on the council hasn't stopped or been impeded. We, we find a way around it, but it's not the same. It's not the same. Even when we have public hearings and people have to participate via Zoom or WebEx, I've learned so many technologies, it's crazy uh, the past few weeks. And I, I can't wait till we can get back to business as usual. We have to put things in perspective. COVID's real. I certainly don't want anybody I know or anybody to contract that. Um, but its survival rate is getting better with the new drugs and treatment and the vaccines getting closer. A normal 10 to 15 year cycle to develop a vaccine now could be possibly done in 12 months. I mean, that's, that's, that's amazing technology and amazing, really good, um, you know, pharmaceutical development. So I'm, I'm pleased about that too. But we, we got to keep our guards up about all these things that can really impact our safety. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fay. Mr. Larson. I think we have to start uh, by recognizing, as you pointed out with the question, this is a global pandemic. And the United States used to lead the world when we went through a crisis of this nature. Instead, we have a leader who's in denial about the science and the medical facts and the advice that he receives. At one point was saying in March that as soon as the weather got warm, it would go away. This is not the case and American citizens know it. This has been a unfortunate and frustrating experience. What we need to do is to make sure that we're leading again in the world that we recognize science and that we recognize what made this country great. What made this country great was when we organized and committed to go to war and we're at war, we're at war with a virus, but we need to mobilize the country. It can't be 50 individual state responses. We need a national plan with a national focus, starting with nationalizing industries in a manner like we did in the Second World War. So they're producing the PPP and the PPE that we need to make sure that our frontliners and our front uh, first responders are getting the kind of equipment that they need. And we lead by example. And we should be convening the whole world as we seek to come up with, a, with a, uh, uh, um, uh, the uh, cure for the virus and provide that to our citizens. And that will require other logistical challenges, logistical challenges that the United States military does extraordinarily well. And they ought to be nationalized on behalf of the American people to make sure that once the vaccine is present and in terms of distributing goods and services and making sure that we have 
enough supplies here for our frontliners and first responders so that we don't have to go outside of the country or outside of the network to get it. That shows leadership around the world and the country. That's what's lacking currently in the White House. That's just one, one quick thing on this. Um, somehow I started talking about COVID. Um, I've been promoting this for some time now. If we wanna deal with COVID, obviously we need the vaccination. And what is happening now? We have all these different labs across the world, all independently working towards the vaccine. I've been calling for open sourcing vaccination research. All labs, private labs, university labs, the corporate labs, the pharmace all the pharmaceutical labs, everyone should be sharing all their COVID vaccination research to the web, to the net, so all can see, so all can work together to solve the problem of getting us a safe, effective, and affordable vaccine, ASAP. People are dying. Now is not the time for concern of profits for Pfizer or AstraZeneca or anyone else. It's the time to get the vaccine and we need to cooperate. Thank you. A related question with a little more specificity came from uh, the audience. Uh, this person said, I've gotten medications manufactured in China or elsewhere that were contaminated with cancer causing chemicals. Other drugs ran short during this crisis. How do you propose to fix this problem? Is it an, isn't it a national security issue? And Mary Faye, Ms. Faye, you get that first. Yes, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, you know, I, I think your safest bet is to stick with uh, pharmaceuticals that are manufactured in the United States. I think that's that's issue number one. So I think maybe um, the FDA and others can maybe do a better front end job of making sure that whatever pharmaceuticals are available to people that they're not contaminated and that they're sourced properly and the supply chain is checked. That's number one. I'd also like to mention that uh, our president has negotiated much better drug prices and he's not beholden to special interest or these pharmaceutical companies. And he's really getting after the price impact to people. It breaks my heart to hear about seniors not being able to afford their medicines or having to ration them or cut them in half or what have you. And it's because of the price. And a lot of these real specialty drugs aren't covered by uh, healthcare plans. So we need to fix that too. We have to be vigilant. People's healthcare is extremely critical. If you don't have public safety and you don't have healthcare, you really don't have too much. So um, those are two things that I think are extremely, extremely important. I'd like to talk a little bit about social security, if I may. Uh, it's a critically important program. I believe in it fully. It was started under Roosevelt and uh, things were different then. Longevity was certainly not what it is now and uh, more people under it and for a longer period of time, et cetera. But I think we need creative solutions that aren't just tax more, tax more, tax more. I mean, that's the easy answer. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to figure out, let's take more out of the people's pockets to fund these things. I propose that when it was originally designed, there's been several things that have done to harm the program that were done by the Democrats, actually. Uh, Mr. Biden did something recently, or, well, he's been in office for 47 years, so I guess it wasn't that recent. But my solution would be to stop taxing Social Security. Stop taxing it. Take away the FIT, the federal income tax. And I would hope that we could, you know, somehow get the states to follow suit. That would give people an automatic raise. And they deserve it. They deserve it. People who have earned their right to get their Social Security, um, you know, should have it tax free. That would help a lot. And we wouldn't have to harm others. And the employers, I mean, we're very business, we're getting very business on friendly with all the taxes that we're layering on. Um, there's lots of solutions for this. I believe people aren't uh, deserve it. They've earned it. They paid into it. But that's one more thing that I, I oppose is I don't think we should be paying out benefits um, for people who have not paid into the system. That's how the whole thing works. It, it's, it's a pay as you go. And maybe we, that should be up for grabs. Maybe it can go into a fund that builds up over time, gets a little bit of a return. 
and doesn't get rated by putting it into the general account. So those are those are my suggestions for making sure that social security is strong and available for everybody who has earned it and deserves it. And to Congressman Larson's point, it's not an entitlement. I do not believe that at all. And I would not do anything to take that away from people. It's their money and they earned it and they deserve the payout. Thank you, Mr. Larson. Except, uh, <clears throat> except uh, Mary, you just said that you would terminate like the president has suggested, he would terminate what is called a payroll tax. It is not a payroll tax. It is an insurance contribution. As you just stated, it's an earned benefit. The AARP recognizes this, and that's why it sent a letter to the president supporting my legislation that says we would overturn any executive order that the president put forward calling upon the termination of the payroll tax. This is a game that's played down in Washington. People say, yeah, everybody's in favor favor of repealing taxes, except when the chief actuary for Social Security came out, nonpartisan, said, listen, that would eliminate Social Security disability by 2021 and Social Security itself by 2023, because there would be no revenue stream to make sure that we have the monies there to pay out to our citizens. More than 10,000 baby boomers a day become eligible for Social Security. And millennials need social security more than baby boomers. For the first time, they're earning less than their parents did. They're having difficulty in their jobs and owning homes and rely more on the fact that the only guarantee, there's no more defined contribution benefit plan in the insurance industry. The only defined benefit that you get is social security. The American people understand this. They've paid for it. They deserve it. And it also helps reduce the national debt as well and make sure because it's the number one anti-poverty program for seniors right. and for our children as well. That's why I am so feel so strongly about it and why we need to step up to the plate. No one should vote for Republican uh, or Democrat or independent based on if they don't have a specific plan for health insurance, if they don't have a plan for social security in Medicare. We hear a lot of platitudes from the Republicans, but no specific plan. Um, Thank you, Mr. Larson. Uh, Mr. McCormick, if you wish to yeah, address the Social Security issue, you may well, do so instead of the question that was- I will, I'll deal with the drugs first, then we'll get into Social Security. Um, one thing has to change, and I, I hope Congressman Larson is not one that has voted for this issue about this. Presently, it costs the American public at least $50 billion more than it should when Medicare goes to buy pharmaceuticals. $50 billion a year taxes, $50 billion a year taxes. Imagine, Mary, because Medicare does not negotiate to buy drugs from the pharmaceutical companies. I hope Congressman Larson did not vote for that. I, I doubt he did, and I hope he doesn't. He can tell us. Um, Drugs from overseas are perfectly safe in the most part. Maybe you don't buy from China. You can certainly buy drugs from Canada. ARP has thoroughly recognized that drugs, generic drugs from Canada and the EU are perfectly safe. Um, and it's outrageous that the American public pays more for their drugs than they pay in Canada or in the EU, absolutely. Social Security, um, the third rail of politics. I, I agree totally with the Congressman on, on what he said. But I would make one modification. Um, I think we need to do this. Um, presently, the Social Security Trust Fund is overwhelmingly invested in treasury bills. I don't think treasury bills are getting what more than one and a half percent at the most. So the return, equity return, interest return to the trust fund is very small. And that makes it very hard to grow over time. And I'll leave this to the actuaries. I'll leave this question to the treasury, but at least some of that social security trust fund should go into the equities market so it earns a real rate of return. If we increase the rate of return in the social security trust fund, that trust fund can undergo the marvelous thing called compounding interest and actually grow 
without us having to pay more payroll taxes, if you want to call, I don't call it payroll tax. I just call it a contribution towards Medicare because it benefits the people. Um, so, so that's what I do with Social Security. Ben, let's get some of that money actually working for us rather than sitting in T-bills that are earning us practically zilch. Thank you. Um, any further? Um, I have several questions. This is going to a different topic, but there's more than one interested party, more than two actually, that asked this question. Would you support setting limits of time in office for the um, United States Congress to a maximum of two terms in the US Senate and four terms in the US House. This person believes that there are studies and polls that show a majority of Americans are in favor of limits of some kind. Um, Mr. Larson, you go first. No, I would not. That. I think that uh, Americans uh, have, ought to have the right to make sure that they vote for whoever they feel is doing the best job on their behalf and who's producing for them. Uh, it's their right to choose and pick whoever they would like. And it's our responsibility to make sure that we're making the ballot box more accessible and more open. Uh, I can understand people's frustration with the system that we're in currently in terms of the lack of response. But when you only have one chamber, in this case, the House of Representatives that's passed over 400 bills that are sitting in the United States Senate, 340 of them have been bipartisanly adopted by the House of Representatives, but the Republican-led Senate by Mitch McConnell hasn't taken any of those up. It's no wonder that people aren't frustrated by this. Yes, there has to be change in the Senate rules, especially as it relates to cloture especially, which means the filibuster rule as well. And I think if we change the rules, that has nothing to do with the constitution. That's simply a Senate rule that blocks legislation and prevents the United States Senate from doing the job that they were elected to do. That's voting on legislation that comes from one chamber to the other. Thank you, um, Mr. McCormick. Um, Term limits sound like a great idea, and I'm kind of almost for them. And the reason I'd be almost for them is because since Citizens United, um, which allows the corporations and the unions, and the unions don't give as much, but only the corporations um, have an outside influence on our politics. It's, we don't have a one person, one vote electing our Congress people, like John says. We have one dollar, one vote type of system. And that keeps people in office. Like John there, he um, takes five, six thousand dollar checks from people like T-Bone Pitkins. He takes them from Rayathon. He takes them from the war contractors. He takes them from the financial industry and the banks, the insurance companies. Um, so, you know, you'll get to stay there because he gets all these nice checks from corporate America. So, and that's not just John, of course, it's um, across the entire Congress, we see this in effect. So term limits, to maybe, but I'll say this, um, a guy called me up last week, um, wanted me to sign some kind of petition on term limits. And I said, geez, you know, as soon as a person gets into Congress, if they have to get out, who's gonna run the committees? Who's gonna know what's going on? So you have to understand that part of this term limits business is not really about term limits at all. It's about having ineffective federal government because you strip knowledge out of the Senate, you strip knowledge out of the House. What do you get? You get more rule by the corporations. So if we had a different financing system for public campaigns, say public financing, and there was a true equal playing field and who gets elected, I would say term limits, yeah, but we don't have that. And until we have that, I, I'm really not in favor of term limits because I think it's there to inviserate the government. And this guy on the phone admitted it to me. It's 
term limits are a recipe for ineffective government because no, you have to have some knowledgeable party that can see things over time, understand what's going on in the tax structure, understands what's going on in the Department of Defense, going on Department of Energy, Interior, Agriculture, all these fields. You need knowledge in the Congress. Thank you. Thank Let you. me say that I would uh, agree with Tom, especially on the- uh, if, Mr. Larson, may I interrupt you for a moment? I need to give uh, Ms. Fay the opportunity oh, and then you, no, no problem. And then you can respond when she has completed. Okay? Yep. Thank you. Ms. Fay. Yes, thank you, Karen. Uh, I believe in term limits. I certainly do. I think uh, 47 years in the case of Vice President Biden, 47 years. Most people don't have careers, real careers that are in business or other sole proprietors or mechanics that last 47 years. That's absurd. And to Tom's point, you know, we when you become beholden to that money, I know it's how it's done. In my case, it's not. This would be the most efficient Congress campaign ever run in the history when I become your next Congresswoman. But uh, it was all on $5, $10 from, from constituents who really believe in our message and what we're trying to do. It's time for a change. So I, I wouldn't be holding, be beholden to any special interest or corporate money. I think once you're in there, I, they expect favors. Why do you think they're giving you that money? They want you to vote in their favor. So I think there's a lot we can do with campaign reform. I think uh, 22 years collecting all this money from special interests, whether it's corporations or PACs or Lord knows where, I think it's very difficult to be a fiercely independent voice like I intend to be. Um, I know it's the game. I, I do believe what Tom said about experience, but you could do it on a staggered basis, just like the Senate. You know, it's not every six years two senators are replaced or up for election, it's staggered. You could do the same thing with Congress. And I don't know what the period of time should be. I certainly do respect knowledge, training, the committee work, and being really representative of your district. It takes a lot of work. It's a hard job. I'm not kidding myself. So I don't know what the term should be. Uh, it should be long enough that you can develop knowledge. But look at the newcomers who have come on. AOC, she's been in for, I don't know, she's, she's a freshman. And she certainly has a lot of clout. She certainly has Nancy Pelosi, the speaker's heir. And I think a freshman congressman can really accomplish a lot. Uh, and that's what I intend to do. So yes, term limits, I think a lifetime in politics with all the special interest you could become beholden to. I think it gets stale, you get things, take it for granted, you're in the same spot and don't have to campaign her hard or earn your vote for the next election. I think we should have a cap. I don't know what the number is. So I'm not gonna to commit to what the question was uh, with, I think it was two terms and four terms, um, but we should have a term in 47 years. I, that, that's, that's incredible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Larson. Well, first of all, let me say that, that I, I agree with Tom, especially when he was talking about campaign finance reform, because this is exactly what's needed. And before you have a system that actually works for all of its citizens where you're not beholding to contributions. I don't ever feel beholding to the contributions that have been made on my behalf. And all you have to do is look at my agenda and my record. And I think they speak for them, speak for themselves. I do believe though that, um, that Tom makes a very valid point with respect to that because what we need is what, what we have here in Connecticut with small donor matches and increase in transparency. The first piece of legislation that the House of Representatives passed that is sitting over in the United States Senate is HR1 that calls for campaign finance reform and for transparency and for donor matching. And that's the direction that I believe that we need to go in. I have long been a proponent of campaign financing and have led on many uh, initiatives in the, in, in the House of Representatives. But if only one chamber is going to pass it and the other chamber is gonna to continue to block it, that's where you have a problem. 
Yeah, I have quick, just a quick question to Mary and to John. Do you support overturning Citizens United? Each one yes. of these? Yes, I do too. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, that, that's a good topic in there. Last, a, a last uh, in, interesting quick answer. Thank you, Tom. Um, we, we, are, we are just about out of time. I believe you each have a little bit of time um, left. And there was one question from the audience that I think merits a, um, a very short response. You can do it for, I'll give you a minute each. Please don't exceed that because the program's coming to an end. This is a question uh, that asks about military service. This, this person's family has served a long time in it. Unfortunately, America has a long and shameful history of not supporting our veterans to the extent they need and deserve. Specifically, how will you support veterans in the first district and beyond? And Mr. McCormick, you get this question first. And please, one minute or less. Okay. All right. Ready? Go ahead. Okay. Um, I don't favor, like a lot of people do, um, special considerations of veterans when it comes to employment. Um, that's discrimination, period. And I'm referring against all forms of discrimination. Um, it's scandalous that on military bases, we have um, privates, corporals, people on the lower levels of the military um, order, so to speak, living in substandard housing. That's unconscionable. Um, it's unconscionable that Asian Orange recognition took so long to take care of the vet's health. And now there's another Asian Orange called depleted uranium left over from the Iraq war and the Gulf War syndrome. We have to make sure that people that sign a contract to defend our country are taken care of in their health. And that when they come out of the military, they can get into a, a job training program, they get some in the military, or they can get like the old GI Bill. People should get get on with their lives. Get that. Um, All right. Thank you, Mr. McCormick. And um, next would be Ms. Fay. One Thank minute. You. Sure. Uh, I respect the military deeply. My grandpa Fay was a colonel in the Air Force. He continued through reserves. He's buried in Arlington Cemetery and all of his children, including my dad, uh, served in, in various branches, Army and Marines. My father is a Korean War vet. I'm very proud of that. And our mom, who we um, unfortunately lost last summer, she is buried in the Veterans uh, Cemetery in Middletown. So. Um, my father's very proud of his service and, and what he did for the country. And on my mom's side, her father was a commander in the Navy and then the boys in the family served time in the military as well. So I, and my brother, I can't forget about him. He was in the Air Force as well as his, his wife was a nurse in the Air Force. They went into the service, chose to after UConn graduating. So I think we need to honor them. Freedom isn't free. Uh, they, we, they, we owe them a debt of gratitude. I think they deserve to, to live in um, um, honorable and decent accommodations. They deserve good health care for sure. And I forgot to mention my father-in-law. He's a West Point graduate and saw two tours of duty in Vietnam. So Thank I you. think the ultimate sacrifice and we've got to take care of our veterans how, how best we can. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Larson. Veterans have a very special place in my heart, uh, growing up in the Vietnam era. Uh, two of my very dear friends, Paul Berry and Craig Jordan, head up and spearhead our council on veterans that we run on a regular basis. We pass legislation. It's not just about talk, it's about passing legislation. Vets to Cops program, which allowed us to hire 12 additional police officers who were veterans to the Harper Police Department disabled veterans. I'm proud to receive the endorsement of disabled veterans of America and their support for Social Security 2100 because they realize how vitally important it is to them and to have also led an effort about this fallen star that recognizes all those who have served our nation and died not only on the battlefield 
but have come home and often sadly neglected as well. We need to stand with our vets always and not just praise them on Memorial Day and on veterans holidays, but actually work for them on a daily basis. Thank you very much, Mr. Larson. And I uh, turn the program now over to Libby Sweetek to thank all of our participants. Thank you for answering the questions, everyone. Okay. Thank you, Carol. And thank you, candidates. And thank you, West Hartford Interactive and our screeners and timers. One quick um, public service announcement, announcement to the audience. Uh, you can check the status of your registration and or your absentee ballot by going to the Secretary of State's uh, website or the town register of, of your particular town. We hope this debate um, assists you in making good choices as we approach the November 3rd election. And um, a reminder that it is not only the federal seat that we just witnessed uh, debate for, but also state uh, assembly matters and as well as the president. So I, uh, I bid you a good night and thank you very much for participating. Thank you all.